So what city was Bach living in 1722? Remember? Kirsten. Yeah. So this is just before he got the job in Leipzig. Book two is just the same. It has 24 preludes and fugues, one in every major and minor key. So let's put that. So in total, Well-Tempered Clavier has 48. Sometimes it's referred to as the 48. You know, it's a nickname for the well tempered program. So, the work that we're going to listen to is from Book One, and it's in G major. I mentioned the fact that preludes and fugues are opposites in a sense. So a fugue is the most important type of polyphonic keyboard work in the Baroque period. Preludes also can be polyphonic, but there's a lot of variety of the different types of preludes that you'll find. So I mentioned the different types. This particular one, um, the G major, is more of a toccata type. So it has kind of an etude element to it. One of the things that I want to point out with this prelude, in comparison then to the next work that we're going to look at, um, well, not the next work, but the first work of Chopin is a Chopin etude. And that Chopin was very much influenced by Bach and would often take one pattern and continuously develop that. So that's what his etudes typically would do. It would take one technical pattern and then that would be something that would you know, be sequenced and developed. So they're alike in that way. And the fugue in this is a three-voice fugue and is one that makes use of melodic inversion. All right, so here we go. Thank you. 
All right, if we'll pass the scores across. Uh, one pray with infusion for one Beethoven sonata. So with your naming the most important keyboard works, this would be the second that's equal in importance of the Beethoven piano sonatas. <clears throat> so I'll ask you about a well-tempered clavier. You should be able to tell me about the two books, 24 in each, 48 in total. You should be able to describe a Bach prelude and a Bach fugue. I'll also ask you, how many piano sonatas did Beethoven write? And the answer would be 32. So the piano sonata was extremely important in Beethoven's literature. And he wrote these in all phases of his career, so even when he no longer could perform. And so we listened during the semester to examples of early Beethoven works such as the Opus 18 string quartets, um, middle period works such as Fifth Symphony, the Opus 59 string quartet, the Fourth Piano Concerto, but we haven't listened to a late Beethoven work yet, and so that's what we're going to do is listen to one of the last five piano sonatas. And so these are referred to as late, late Beethoven. So it doesn't mean that he was dead, but that these are the, the final uh, works of his career. And so in these final works of Beethoven's career, there are certain characteristics that, um, that emerge. So one of those is the increased use of counterpoint, of contrapuntal forms and contrapuntal techniques. So he was writing fugues. Fugato development sections or Fugato variations and theme and variation movements. So you'll see in these late uh, piano sonatas that several of them do have fugues. Um, Opus 110, which is the second to last, has the last movement that, that has two fugues in it. Um, Opus 106 has a final movement, the Hammer that has a three voice fugue. Um, and then Fugato development sections in the last movement of 101. Um, the one that we're going to listen to is Opus 109. And so this is sonata number 30 of the 32. The last three sonatas were all written at the same time. And so they were finished around 1822 or so. <coughs> and were published consecutively, Opus 109, Opus 110, Opus 111, so those are the last three. So look for this, the use of counterpoint, so that's a Bach influence.
The last thing Beethoven was studying when he died was the Art of Fugue by Bach, which was the last work that Bach was working on, which was not totally finished. All right. <clears throat> Another characteristic is his use of theme and variation forms. And theme and variation, as I mentioned before, is the most flexible of the forms associated with sonata cycle works. So you have the most um, leeway as far as exactly what's going to happen. It's, it's just a general concept of this idea of variations on a theme. Um, things that are the same as the theme, and things that are different than the theme. But Beethoven takes it into new realms of um, discourse. And so the, his variations would be much further removed on an obvious level from the theme than what you'll find in Mozart and Haydn, which Mozart and Haydn tended to be more um, melodic ornamentation. It was always really clear how it was related to the theme. But with these late Beethoven works, then you start to have a uh, much greater um, contrast with the variation as compared to the theme. So they're, they're a lot more complex. So we'll see in this Opus 109, the last movement is a set of theme and variations. The same form is used for the last movement of the Ninth Symphony. And his last great uh, work for solo piano is the set that's called the Diabelli Variations, which takes almost an hour to perform. So it's huge monumental work based on this very trivial theme by Diabelli. And so that idea of something very profound coming from something trivial is going to be a romantic concept. We'll see that with Mahler, actually, Mahler symphonies. So theme and variation is really important. And then a final thing, which uh, we've seen this in the Fifth Symphony, is that the length and the importance of the last movement um, is something that's underscored. So, so in this particular sonata, the first two movements. Um, each take approximately three minutes to perform. So it's about six minutes to, to hear the first two movements. And then the last movement is almost 15 minutes long. And so the total is about a 20 minute uh, sonata. And a few more things that we'll see with these late Beethoven works is that Beethoven begins to write performance directions in German in addition to Italian. So if you look at this score that I just gave you, which has the first two movements, you turn the last page, that's the beginning of the last movement, the theme variation movement. And you see there that he writes the performance directions first in German and then the Italian version of it just below. And so that's something that makes these works more personal, that he was using his own vernacular language for directions to the performer. That's something that, that romantic German composers will continue. Someone like Robert Schumann does the same thing. Another characteristic is this meaning of extremes, the sublime versus the ridiculous. We also see with Beethoven in his piano works his use of unconventional pedal markings in which long passages are all blurred together. And so some musicologists have said that might have been because of his loss of hearing by the time Beethoven was writing these works. Um, and in general, the late works are those that were written after 1815 and were published as Opus 100 and higher. 
So we'll put that here. Oh, plus 100 higher after 8.15. So on these keyboard works, he starts to just, he just extends the range of the instrument. And so you'll have passages like on that first page of Opus 109, how on the second to last system, he has both hands in the very highest range of the instrument. And, and then that just moves all the way from the highest range to the very lowest range. Um, if you turn to the fourth page, that type of writing there on the fourth page, um, measure 66 for the next couple of phrases. Again, both hands are in the very highest range, and it gives an, an ethereal kind of quality. Some musicologists have said that it was because, again, Beethoven couldn't hear. He was trying to, you know, uh, he wrote higher and higher as his um, hearing uh, deteriorated. But um, that idea of you know, meeting of extremes is something that is, is characteristic. Another thing about these late works is their use of the use of form. And Beethoven is really um, expanding the possibilities of form, sonata allegro form. And one musicologist described it at like um, looking at a familiar landscape after an earthquake. As you can see, the basic elements of the form, that everything is rearranged so much that it looks like an, a new scene. And so this movement, uh, first movement in Opus 109, is an example of that. So the A theme is presented at the very beginning. It's dolce. It has a compound line, which just means that it's one note at a time that sounds, but it alternates between two registers so that it sounds like you have two voices that are in conversation. And it's a string type of writing. You'll find that a lot in, uh, in works you know, for string instruments. Um, it only lasts, though, for eight measures until you have then a tempo change, a meter change. It, it changes to adagio. Espressivo, but then it's forte. And you have this B 